Hey there, it's Stella. I actually put my contacts in today. So that means that it's time to read a selection from The Local Economy Revolution Has Arrived, What's Changed and How You Can Help. Available wherever you get your books, probably one you gotta order. Not a, not a Tom Clancy novel by any stretch. So the section for today is called The Machinery of Innovation. And this was a new chapter that was added to this book after the first version, which was published back in 2013. So this is new stuff that came out with this year's version. For my co-founder and I, the, oh, the title, we'll, we'll give you that part first. So the title of this section is called Machinery of Innovation. And it focuses on what a co-founder and I learned about how to actually facilitate innovation and not just leave it to luck or chaos theory or a butterfly sneezing in Nepal or whatever. So this is the machinery of innovation. The purpose of Econogy was to accelerate innovation for the places and people we care most about. That includes universities and neighborhoods, businesses and nonprofits, wealthy and disadvantaged students and seniors. We focused our first two years on building a new machinery of innovation, a system for unlocking the capabilities and lack of barriers that one of our overlooked sources of innovation, our young adults, could bring to business and community problem solving. We found that a support structure that combines diverse teams, clear processes, and high stakes stretch challenges resulted in practical but innovative solutions to problems that had no cookie cutter answer. From both a business and a human development standpoint, the results were better than we, well, I at least, expected. We then tried the same methods with adults of varying ages faced with creating strategies for their community's future, and we had similar results. Consistently, people outperform our expectations when we place around them a structure that enables them to solve problems collaboratively and constructively. And innovation research has found the same. For example, they have found that diverse teams consistently make better d decisions, potentially because they, quote, alter the behavior of a group's social majority in ways that lead to improved and more accurate group thinking. <coughs> Excuse me. Second, when teams use explicit structured processes to examine choices and make decisions, they're more likely to succeed. Conversely, when leaders assume that the team will just figure it out for themselves, something I've called playing by the rules that we learned in kindergarten, then the team is more likely to fail. And finally, creating useful solutions to problems that do not have direct precedence require a fundamentally different approach than simply tweaking things that have been done before. And being too familiar with the things that have been done before can be like a pair of blinders, making it impossible to see feasible alternatives that fall outside your expectations. So what's the takeaway from that? Well, what we have found there and what I've found consistently throughout my career is that we tend to make one of two mistakes. We either assume that 
we don't need to involve the great unwashed and we just need to, whether it's a business decision or a community decision or an organization decision, it's, it's this human, this is a human trait. So I've seen this across the spectrum. Sometimes, a lot of times we assume that the only people who should be the decision makers are those who are already within um, what I used to call the star chamber. And that's a reference to an old movie. You can, you can Google it and, and find what that looks like. But that was a, um, but it, it's a, it's a very small group of people who are charged with making the decisions for a much larger population. And we do that because we value expertise, but sometimes we overvalue expertise and we spend too much of our attention and too much of our, um, we give too much of our decision-making authority to that star chamber, that small group of people. On the other hand, we very often see situations, especially in community development or urban planning or businesses that are trying to be very open to the community and very progressive with a small p, We'll see a lot of opening it up to the community, but with no structure whatsoever. Um, I've called that before the Santa Claus list. It's as though that leadership, business, city, whatever, says, well, what do you want? And they sit there and they wait, like Santa Claus, waiting for you to tell him what you want for Christmas. And so people tell them, I want a puppy and a kitty and a rocket launcher. And, you know, and, it, and it's, it's, it's a list that is very often, at least partially, if not greatly, disconnected from reality. If we're the leader in a decision-making process and we don't want to fall into either of those two traps, the Star Chamber, or the Santa Claus list, we have to create a structure. We have to create a system. In another place in the book, I tell the story of watching one of my son's first grade teacher and the way that she enabled the students, very young students. A six, six-year-old doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of skills in anything, but enabling these students to be able to do the things that they needed to do in order to build the skills and the knowledge that they needed, not by her sitting there and going, Jimmy, go there, Tommy, go there, don't do that, don't stop, do this, move there, whatever, but by setting up a structure of at certain times we do this, this is where this item goes, we have this activity in this corner and we have this activity in that corner that made it easy for the students to bring them be their best selves to the table and to collaborate most effectively because that structure gave them a place in which to do that. So when I have done public engagement in my past, in my career as an economic developer, I didn't ask the question, what do you want? We asked much more specific questions. And we gave people different ways to participate, different ways to respond to ways that didn't just rely on the spoken word, but that also allowed people to, to draw, to speak, to write, to tell their story to an individual one-on-one, -on -one, to create a collage, to do all of the different things that we could think of that would allow people to give their feedback, but do it in a structured way that kept them on task that, and that allowed them to bring them best selves to the table. So we weren't relying on the star chamber and we weren't just asking for a Santa Claus list. And nine times out of 10, what we gained from that process which is more complicated to set up than the average, you know, what do you want here kind of, of public meeting 
or what do you think we should create next kind of public outreach, we got much better responses. We got much more meaningful information. And most importantly, we got information that we could then take and collaborate further with that community to build out what we were trying to create. And co-construction is a, is a story for another day. So we'll leave it for another day. So thanks for joining me. If you're interested in this, if you want to think about what the future of your community, your business, your organization, or your role in the world around you might look like. I talk about that as being future ready. So if you want to be looking at new ways to for the places you care about to help them become future ready, check out wiseeconomy.com. Check out the Wise Economy YouTube channel and you'll find lots and lots of resources at both wiseeconomy.com and on YouTube, um, Substack, all over the place. So let's work on learning how to create the communities that we want to be in together. Thanks. Go get them.